I'm inviting on stage Dan Shetman. Please, on stage. There is no stage, actually, but we have uh, VIP chairs. Uh, Didier Quellos, you can sit here. Didier is here. Didier, he's not here, I guess, yet. Okay. Novoselov. Konstantin, where are you? Okay, okay. Have a seat here. Where? Here. I'm sitting here, here, sit there. Um, Hi, Professor I Roberts. Just like uh, a month ago, right, in Japan. <laughs> Roberts, okay. Uh, an applause, please, too quiet. Professor Suresh. I didn't realize this was happening. Where is he? He was here. He was in the same table. We're going to wait for him. And uh, Nectarios Tavernarakis. Hey. And I'm going to bring a lawyer to be safe here. Malcolm McNeil, come here and protect me. <laughs> um, we have miss we are missing Roberts and uh, yeah Roberts is missing and Supra Suresh. We can continue and then uh, then and uh, also Professor Haruiko Inufusa. So we are, how many chairs we have? I think we're missing one. So this is not about science, it's about fun, huh? Well, uh, science is about fun, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's, that, that's uh, actually what I should have said that he said it for me. Science is fun, actually. So, uh, I mean, the, this is, um, I mean, we're not discussing, we're, we're not, I'm saying that science is not fun, but uh, what, uh, what we were discussed tonight is just, uh, you know, a humor about uh, Nobel laureate life, how it looks like, what it was before, what is after, how, what changed, and what, uh, what bring it to you. For example, I, I know that, Danny, this, uh, this issue is uh, very hard, very, you know, I, you love this theme, so please tell us how your life changed after you became a Nobel laureate. Okay, I'm not sure that it's very interesting, but anyway, uh, the Nobel Prize is a life-changing event for myself, of course, but also for my family and friends. And it opens the world towards you. And suddenly, people feel that everything you say is very, a very wise something, regardless of whether you understand the subject or not. They look at you with admiration, which is not the right thing to do. We are, well, let me talk about myself. I am a normal person like everybody else with some good scientific achievements that uh, brought me uh, here now and to many other places before. But I see the main advantage of becoming such a lawyer is the effect that you have a chance to travel the world and talk about your ideas and promote worthy causes around the world some of them are scientific causes, some of them are humanistic causes, some of them have to go with what I do, to do with education, uh, entrepreneurship, and uh, health, and the power of science. Many people, of course not you, but many people in the street do not really appreciate what science has done for us in our generation. 
And the progress is amazing. Let me give you one example, and that will be my last words here. In the 14th century, there was the Black Plague in Europe. There was no science, and it killed about one third of the population, if not more, of all Europe. It killed millions. No cure, and then the, the pandemic disappeared. 1928, the discovery of penicillin, Fleming. He discovered the penicillin by observation. He did not invent it, but he made a good observation, and he discovered penicillin. And in England, they started to produce penicillin and they could not produce in good quantities. And then the United States came into the game. They changed the system. I'm not going to discuss how. And they started to produce penicillin in large quantities, so much so that in 1945, penicillin was available to the public. 17 years between the day of the discovery and the day in which penicillin was available to the public and saved lives of a million people. Fast forward, two, three years ago, we had the COVID uh, pandemic. And in one year, Moderna and BioNTech developed a technology based on pure science and real understanding of messenger RNA, and based on pure science, within one year, vaccination was available to hundreds of million people and saved endless number of lives. And this is science today. I can only imagine what science will do in the future. Hopefully, the power will be used for good causes. Well, you made it interesting. So, we're going to Professor Adovo Salon, different generation. So, right. I, uh, I know that you, for you, uh, it was work continuing, doubling, tripling. Right. That's. Yeah, I partly agree with Dan and, and, and partly disagree. I, I completely agree that after the Nobel Prize, suddenly you can dance, you can sing, and all your rubbish jokes become <laughs> irresistibly funny. Just people, people laugh like uh, like crazy. But then, uh, for me, it was actually the the other way around. It gave me a chance not to go to the conferences because I needed. I, I didn't need to promote anything, so I just I could actually focus on the on the next uh, stage of my of my research, which was which was really great. But then, uh, but then, uh, as Dan said, you, you you actually have a chance to promote the the uh, the good solutions for the good courses, and that's uh, partly true. But then, um, politicians usually they pretend that they listen so you just you go to the world economic forum and then you get all those invitations and you are full of full of energy to fight for the for the fundamental science and then they give you like a, a small sandpit with only scientists and then and then we just argue on this on this panel which which uh, whose integral is longer and then and then it's basically just the the end of the story so they 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 pretend i mean we actually do work and they pretend that they they listen unfortunately that's that's very true i mentioned it several times in my presentation uh, every time i mentioned this so we are, we agree on that but also you uh, professor roberts you are using the fact that you are nobel laureate for a cause so there is a there is a myth around uh, a particular, you know, you can explain it yourself. So there is a myth, people saying no um, genetic modified food. So this is uh, around the world and even in Thailand, they, many people are against genetic modified food. But genetic modified food is coming from the scientific research and but many government are against this because they think this is uh, is damaging for human uh, for humans so and professor Roberts is using this and he has the majority of Nobel laureates behind him and I agree with him so if you are against if uh, it's proven that something is dangerous 
then you can correct it. But to go flat out against the genetic, genetically modified food, I find it a little strange and again science. So now we are in the serious uh, discussions, but I wanted to have it fun. Uh, how this helps you being a Nobel to, 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 to make this point? So I, I, are you worrying now that our food is genetically modified? And, uh, no, it's illegal in, in Thailand. <laughs> Just yours, cost you. <laughs> so, how this helps I you? I always feel like, like would you have lab rats, right? <laughs> <laughs> Would you have achieved the same results if you would not have been Nobel laureate? Well, so I'm not going to talk about GMOs today because I'm going to talk about those tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, but I think one of the things that happens when you win the Nobel Prize is that before you were a Nobel laureate, people sometimes listen, as you say. Sometimes they laugh at your jokes, but not always. But once you win a Nobel Prize, people listen. But I think the most interesting aspect is that sometimes people act on what you say. And so I've, one of the things that I've been doing is to run a series of campaigns um, to get Nobel laureates to back good causes. And I, I'm glad to say that my fellow laureates here have signed on to some of these, and I hope they will sign on to more. But what we find is that if we talk to politicians, and if there are a large number of us talking, sometimes the politicians will in fact act and will do something. And I'll just give you one example of this. Um, a number of years ago, there were some nurses in Libya who'd been accused of spreading HIV in the children's hospital in Benghazi. And they ended up, they were tortured. Um, Gaddafi decided that they were guilty and they were on death row. And when I found out about this, I, ordered, I organized a campaign with the Nobel laureates. And in fact, we had more than 120 who signed on. I was invited to Libya to go and talk to Gaddafi's son. And shortly after that, the nurses were released. And it, it was only because the Nobel laureates had signed this agreement, had signed a campaign, had brought attention to the issue. And then the diplomats in Europe and Egypt and elsewhere uh, made sure that something happened as a result of that. And so I'm hoping that the GMO campaign, which I will talk about tomorrow, will have some similar kinds of effects. So you have behind you really a, a, a good support and good efficiency by having the title. So uh, what about um, someone that has not the title yet? Professor, Professor Tavenerakis, what, uh, what do you think about this? As a vice president of European Research Council. Yes, you've got much more power than all the Nobel laureates collectively. <laughs> Just, we, we all listen to that. Well, yes. That's correct. Well, the ERC supports uh, Nobel laureates in Europe. Uh, actually, uh, this year even some uh, ERC grantees uh, were among the Nobel laureates of, uh, of this year. But I think it's important that uh, the kind of power that uh, uh, Nobel laureates are wielding is uh, actually sufficient sometimes to cause change and uh, uh, steer in the right direction. I think this is, uh, this is incredible. This is uh, power that few people have uh, on this earth. And it's important that um, it's been used uh, the way that uh, we uh, uh, heard earlier. Uh, now, with regard to the ERC, the ERC, as you know, is funding basic research. Basic fundamental research is at the basis of what we are now enjoying. For example, um, it was mentioned that uh, the RNA technology, the RNA technology that is behind the, the vaccines, uh, was developed through uh, uh, funding by the ERC. BioNTech and the people behind this company were actually ERC grantees. And it's because of this support that uh, they were able to develop their ideas into a stage that uh, then was able to uh, become a product that saved lives. So it is very important that uh, we value uh, fundamental research because what we are seeing these days is that we are moving away from uh, funding fundamental research, but instead focusing on applied, on translational research, which I think in the long run is wrong. 
we should be funding uh, fundamental res research because uh, it's it's that kind of research blue uh, sky research that's uh, not uh, driven by anything else than uh, human curiosity that is actually now uh, we are capitalizing on uh, for all these uh, innovative products and services that we are enjoying if we lose that basis in the long run i think we are going to suffer and the erc is contributing on the, in in that direction by uh, focusing on supporting uh, young scientists especially uh, to uh, follow their ideas, uh, do uh, innovative research that will eventually also become innovative products that will save lives. So my message would be that it is really uh, of the highest importance uh, to focus on the support of fundamental research. Uh, as we know, uh, rational reasoning is under attack across the world, unfortunately. And um, uh, it's now the idea that uh, we need instant uh, gratification uh, from wherever uh, we, uh, for example, provide support. And uh, this is uh, uh, causing us to abandon the basis uh, that we need. So uh, that would be my message. So... Uh now, your research is to extend human life. So where are you planning it? 100, 120, 150? The, the, we, we have two, two extremes here. This is on the fundamental side, extending uh, you know, the uh, lifespan of humans. And on the other side, we have Professor Hariko Inafusa, who has a product that helps in this direction. And they are working also with Professor Yoshikawa to extend life. So where you where are looking at? How, how many years? 150, 120, 200 years? By the way, when I was in Japan, I was with Professor Hiroiko and Professor Yoshikawa, and uh, we have an appointment. We have an appointment 100 years exactly after the date of our dinner in Osaka, in 2222. Is correct? So this is our appointment, and I have it in my iPhone. <laughs> Well, let me first clarify that uh, it's, my research is not aiming to extend human lifespan, <laughs> for sure. At this point, we are uh, merely trying to understand the aging process. And of course, we are using uh, model organisms, exper experimental organisms. And we have been able, not just my lab, but actually laboratories around the world to extend lifespan of experimental organisms. That doesn't mean that uh, we can do this in humans. Actually, we are far away from understanding the aging process as a whole. And uh, everything actually impinges on the aging process. So it's a very complex phenomenon. We do know a few things. We found out a few things, but we are missing uh, many, many pieces. So I think we are far, far away from uh, actually uh, talking about extending human lifespan. Although uh, I know that uh, especially in the entrepreneurial world, there are even huge businesses these days that are investing. Uh, Calico in the United States, uh, the Breakthrough Foundation, for example, other um, um, uh, people, uh, mostly uh, billionaires, are actually now investing in this enterprise, which I think you know is is uh, is ill-based and is not going to um, really uh, uh, cause any real change in the way we understand the aging. We need a lot of fundamental research before we we go there. And uh, this is actually a very uh, interesting area of biology because it also relates to uh, many uh, diseases that are now becoming more and more frequent because uh, life, life expectancy in humans is increasing. So this is causing sustainability problems, if we are talking about sustainability, to human health uh, care systems around the world. For example, Alzheimer's disease is becoming a huge burden in Europe, in the United States, uh, I know. So uh, research on aging can actually yield results that are useful uh, towards addressing these issues, these problems, mm -hmm. and um, uh, increasing the quality of life uh, in uh, old people. And I think this is the most important consequence of research on aging right now. Not to extend lifespan, which I think, you know, also, we can uh, uh, argue about uh, ethical problems that uh, this might have, but uh, instead uh, knowledge that will be used to uh, uh, better the life of old people. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it is becoming uh, a necessity, it is becoming a challenge, exactly because these pathologies that used to be rare some decades ago are now becoming very frequent. Actually, the, the World Health Organization is estimating that uh, by uh, 2030, 2040, there will be more than 120 billion, uh, million people uh, uh, inflicted with Alzheimer's disease around the globe. This is a huge number because here we are not talking about a disease that can be cured with a vaccine or that there is a drug that will cure it in a short term, uh, uh, short period of time. We are talking about people that will go on living for 10, 20 years even. And this is not just a burden for them, it's a burden for the society as a whole, for their families, uh, their loved ones. So it's these diseases that are now becoming chronic uh, burden to the society that I think aging research can uh, yield some interesting results towards uh, benefiting these people. Actually, here we are. We have a product against uh, Alzheimer's. It's the invention of Professor uh, Inufusa. Both red and, red and white. <laughs> Uh, so uh, no, I'm serious. Uh, the uh, and the we have a symposium dedicated to Professor Shikawa about uh, antioxidant and aging included, and Professor Infusa has uh, invented uh, one of the most powerful antioxidant in the world, and has been proven uh, uh, in very good results against the dementia. So we have already a very good uh, uh, advancement in this. Uh, but I, I let uh, Professor Yoshikawa, to, uh, Professor. In Fusa to say something. Um, first of all, I'm standing at the very far side of the Nobel Prize, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but I was just ordinary uh, surgeons of the gastrointestinal for 25 years. At the same time, keep doing the research on the cancers, because after the surgery, many people have a recurrence and then dies, cannot, you know help them. So if I found something in my research, that would be uh, very good for that you know, cancer patient. That is uh, you know, main, my main target. And then uh, uh, accidentally, I found that the very strong antioxidant compositions. Now I'm, I'm concentrating to doing that research. And then uh, uh, as Florian told, um, uh, by the clinical um, study, um, we succeeded to the prevention of the dementia. Uh, no pharmaceutical company succeeded. So in, in, in that meaning, I was really, really lucky. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, my, final my final, final target is um, how many people I can help for that health or, uh, um, you know, to prevent disease or uh, reduce that symptoms. That is my simple target. Thank you. Yeah, so this is actually very interesting because uh, managing the oxidative stress can, can tackle all the diseases at the same time. Not just specific one disease, one, one medication per disease, but it tackles everything. It reduces oxidative stress, prevention and cure at the same time. And this is a, a really a dawn of antioxidant therapy. Has been very successful in very, in very, and we have witnesses here. Uh, Mario is raising his hand. His father was uh, almost uh, barely walking. Doctors told him f in, in four or five months he would be probably going to normal. And in two weeks he he has a very quality of life. He's joking now, and he is a he has a prostate cancer. He has a, he had a COVID. He was in ICU for two, twelve uh, for for twelve days and. Uh, 17 days so and then uh, with those he is able now to walk very quality of high quality of life psa was 14 1400 in two months dropped to 700 now it is 500 but even it, when it was 1400 which is 1000 more than normal he was walking and doing a normal life that quality of life you mentioned so but on the legal side so it's pretty uh, amazing this symposium that war uh, how this oxidative stress management helps all diseases so uh, now um, i'm asking the only lawyer so <laughs> So, um, uh, to, to, to make the legal background, okay? So if people go 150 years old, 
So by the way, I'm not joking. I have a meeting with Professor Yoshikawa. I is in my calendar here. It is at 11 a.m. 25th of August, 2122. Hello. I have it here. <laughs> hello, hello. It, well, <laughs> you know that it's actually every, it, it costs hello. Uh, 500. You need to pay to do, do, do you need money. <laughs> so it actually costs you. 500 bahts for, for uh, to, to ask a, a lawyer, right? Just yeah, well, not here. <laughs> here it is for free. Yeah, These here. lawyers are paid thousand or more dollars per hour. Okay. Uh, Sips, yes. In Sips, you have it for free. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> ask me whatever you want. I'll be here, okay? And that advice will be worth exactly what you're paying for. So... Uh, <laughs> First of all, I want to say uh, it's great to be up here on stage, and it's a little bit daunting to be up here with such an esteemed group of scientists. And I think it's, uh, for, I mean, as a personal issue, I'll tell you that the law teaches you to be curious. The law teaches you to be critical. You go to law school and you're taught with the Socratic method and, and you're constantly being bombarded with questions that the Supreme Court of the United States decides five to four. And here you are as a student being asked to decide a question that's being presented to you. And you're like, wow. And it, it, so we're we're. We're weaned on the idea of uncertainty and we're asked to make certainty out of uncertainty. And how that translates once you're into practice is that I've dealt with a lot of federal agencies like the federal, uh, the, the FTC, the FDA, and a lot of administrative bodies. And I will tell you that the, the important thing is to make sure that the law protects the ability for these gentlemen and others in the scientific community to be acting as critical thinkers themselves in what they do and to question them themselves and to not be worried about the consequences of coming up with a novel or controversial idea. And that's what the law tries to protect. I can speak for myself that I, when, when I attended uh, SIPS the first time and attended here, I, I find it fascinating to attend the sessions on, on subjects that I've never dealt with in such detail as we've dealt with here. Uh, I'm on the board of the Atlantic Legal Foundation, and I'll give you a pretty good example of what that organization does. It Its purpose is to assure that the courts, when they receive evidence of a scientific nature, that it the judge has an obligation to explore the evidence before it would ever get to a jury. And the judge has to decide whether or not the individuals who are presenting that evidence have the capacity and the educational background in order to present the evidence in order to avoid a jury or a court making a decision based on junk science. And junk science is one of the things that was seeping into the court system before a case called Dauber. And the lawyers ended up, that case went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, if you're going to, you're not, you just can't have anybody walk into court and claim that they're an, ex, an expert on microbiology or metallurgy or whatever you want to call it. If it's a scientific thing that requires a specific knowledge in a given area, you have to demonstrate that the person who is testifying is capable to do so. And yes, you'll have experts testify on both sides of these issues. You'll have test, you'll have experts disagree over what is the appropriate construction material for a high rise. You'll have people disagree over what should be done with an internal combustion engine and what should be done to make it safe for society. But the point is you'll hear it from two individuals who may come to it from different perspectives, but they're presenting their positions scientifically based on the evidence that they've analyzed and the jury can decide what their what the the what the jury sees as the correct uh, role of that evidence and, and how way, excuse me, how it weighs into the case. So what I would say to begin with is that um, the law and, and by the way, the cases that come down through the court system in the United States are the ones that make policy. They're the ones that go up and the senators and the congressmen hear about it. And the next thing you know, there's legislation being uh, passed. Next thing you know, it's being argued about on in scientific journals, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, everywhere you want to look. And those those uh, vibrant discussions take place. And eventually policy is being made.
So the law serves a very important purpose to make sure that we can have conversations like this and also have events like this, symposia like this, so that when we get together, we can actually argue about these issues, think about them, discuss them, and not have voices shut down because somebody comes up with something which is new, novel, or controversial. It's an important part of, I think, the scientific uh, um, growth because that it's that kind of a voice that needs to be protected. As a lawyer, when I've dealt with administrative agencies, that's exactly what I've dealt with is administrative types at the government level who don't understand the process or they have their own agenda based on some policy making that's taken place through the government or the, they, they've got their, they have their own biases or biases and those biases can seep into decision making in federal agencies, which can hold uh, when um, Daniel mentioned a moment ago about uh, 17 years before between penicillin being discovered or, or invented to the time it was actually on the market, some of that time was probably very good. Some of the time was probably not, meaning it might have been delayed through fear, through caution, through a variety of things. I don't know specifically, but I will certainly tell you that, um, that the, those decisions are made by individuals and those individuals must have the right, the right framework. So with that, that's what that's the rule of law that applies to scientific research and discourse. It's perfect from a legal point of view, but you didn't touch the one I asked. Is this a human right to live 200 years old? <laughs> this is uh, for the Supreme Court. That, that is for the Supreme Court, which will probably be decided by nine people who are probably somewhere between 150 and 200 years old by the time that decision <laughs> arises. I, 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 I wouldn't see as, as, an, as a human right. I mean, keep in mind, we all talk about human rights, and I'll, I'll actually move it into a serious realm of saying it's also with every right that's created, there's a responsibility. And people forget that. We talk about human rights all the time. We talk about societies and the, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with, with the uh, United Nations. And there's a reciprocal um, uh, group which is put together in a document which is chronicled called the Universal Declaration on Human Responsibilities. So if we do extend life and we extend it to 150 years, the question is exactly what was brought up before. What do, how does society adapt for having... Um, uh, a, a group of, let's say, 100 to 125-year-olds. What is their physical capability? What, are, what does society require to do to that in order to make sure that their life is not just extended, but that it's meaningful and that society is protected, as you mentioned earlier? Society has to uh, provide, it has to anticipate that and provide the mechanisms like we do today. Uh, 50 years ago, you didn't see... Through science, I guess. I'm sorry? Through science. Through science, 50 years ago, we were not taking care of uh, providing the appropriate accommodations for disabled people. Now we do as a normal course. What kind of uh, similar accommodations are we going to have to do for our newly aged and advanced aged population? So the law will help develop that because what's going to happen is as society, all of the disability accommodations all came as a result of legal cases. They came as a result of legal cases that were brought demanding the accommodations for uh, people who may have been blind, who may have been in wheelchairs, etc. They all came through the law. So the next step would be to is to make sure that the right people give us the right information to fight for the right accommodations for the aging society. So for the Supreme Court, uh, it will come up. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, that's why he's uh, president of uh, Beverly Hill Bar Association, you know. <laughs> okay, so switching gears. Yeah, you wanted to say something? No, I, I would, No, I was just saying. Yeah, no, I was just saying. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, through. through um, I think that all of us have an, a responsibility to critically think about what does society look like. What does that society look like that you envision? What you didn't tell me though. What was the date of your meeting in twenty? In twenty twenty-five, twenty-fifth of August. 11 a.m. 2,122. I think I'm busy, but what day of the week is that? <laughs> <laughs> what date of the week? I tell you. I tell you what date of the week it is. It is... Uh, 
Well, it, it went. It is Monday. Ah, okay. Well, so, that, do you have a court case of the date? No, but that's the day I've selected to put my DVD collection in alphabetical order. So I'm not sure I'm <laughs> going to be able to be there. Good. Okay, switching gear. So uh, a little bit more, completely different. How much we should work to be successful to get a Nobel uh, Prize? How long? Who's going to take? Two hours per day? Two hours per day? 13, 14? I don't think it's... Uh, I, I don't think you'll ask this question. For some of us, uh, a discovery is made in one minute. Other people work for 20 years on developing something. It varies, it depends on the subject. Uh, no, there's no, there's no, there's no answer there's for no everybody. It's, it's totally, totally uh, arbitrary. Uh, and, and, uh, but one thing I can tell you all, we do not work for the Nobel Prize. We work for understanding nature. And if prizes come later, then that means society really thinks we did a good job. But we don't work. I don't know anybody of us who was working for the Nobel. Well, um, I remember very well, that's just a little bit different. I, I think uh, Einstein, uh, he was arguing with his wife. They were in a very difficult economic position. And his way out to convince his wife not to have a divorce was that, don't worry, I'm going to get the Nobel Prize and I have a lot of money. So this was a unique case in the history. So how long we should work? Should we have a plan at least? I can tell it doesn't work, so sh she won't believe you that <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I think mo most people who make a Nobel Prize winning discovery are lucky. It is luck yeah. that is much more important than anything else. We do science, just like Danny says. Because we love it. Yeah, this, sure. this is we're what we love to do. It's our hobby. We work as many hours as our wives will let us. And if we're lucky, we make a big discovery. But even the little discoveries are great too. But never, never set your sights on a Nobel Prize. If you get one, it's luck. Well, sure. It is, uh, we, we agree with that. But that's the, oh, the idea was, what is a normal normal working hour for uh, a normal scientist well, you see if you are a normal scientist you just you just work all your life so there is because you cannot do it you cannot do science uh eight, eight nine to five right so that's then you just by definition then you work hard and then if you don't work hard then then you're you just you're not a scientist yeah, because somebody says, if you don't work eight hours per week, you are not professional. So this is a, a wild... Oh, well, you see, I mean, all my, <laughs> uh, just all my best ideas, they just come to me in my dreams. So just, In your stairs. I've in, seen my, your in my dreams, right. I've That's seen the... your picture in the lab, in your stairs. Right, okay. <laughs> so, how, how long you work, uh, Professor Inafusa? What's your, how your day of work looks like? Um, I worked as a sergeant over 25 years, and then uh, I did additional research work, maybe six or eight hours every day. So in total? In the total, so that 25 years uh, by eight hours every day. 25 years, eight hours every day? Yeah. Correct. This is normal, normal charge. What about a, a lawyer? So, do you work during the night? No? Yes, I was, when when you called me up to the stage, I was responding to emails back home. So the answer is we work. That's why they call it practicing. We're constantly practicing. I've been practicing more than thirty-five years, and I will tell you that uh, the practice consumes, especially if you do international work. The practice consumes you day and night because I'm on the phone at ten o'clock at night from Los Angeles with Asia. I'm on the phone at eight o'clock in the morning with Europe. So the work uh, the work follows you, uh, and and it's just it's part it's part of your skin. It's part of your skin as a lawyer, especially if you're doing international work. A thick skin? 
So, well, you need thick skin sometimes with judges. You need thick skin sometimes with clients. Clients come in all sizes and shapes, too. One of my old timers once told me when I was first becoming a lawyer, he says, you know, the practice of law is the best profession in the world, or it would be the best profession in the world if it weren't for judges and clients. That was the way he looked at it after you've been practicing for 50 years. So, By the way, how, how many hours judges work? I... <laughs> There might be a judge in the crowd, and this may be recorded, so yeah, I refrain from There is no judge asking, here, not yet, not yet in SIP. Probably we should invite them. In our system, uh, the judges, they were, I should say in California, because we have 50 states and there's all kinds of different court systems, but I'll tell you that the judges work pretty hard. In L.A. County, for example, the average judge has 180 cases on their docket. It's 180 cases where most of them just breeze their way through and they very get very little court attention because the lawyers argue among themselves and eventually settle the case. But the other ones that are hotly contested, they're the ones that are in court every day fighting because they can't agree to anything. It's costing the clients money. It causes the judge to have to make decisions or read stacks of papers. And they have to read those stacks of papers in between yeah, the trials that are taking place in their courtroom. Correct. So they do, they do work pretty hard more than eight hours a day uh i probably say eight hours a day okay, yeah that's normal what about uh, professor tavenarakis how it looks in to do the research by the by the you know by the sea summer year long how how much time you spend on research how much on the beach I don't think that the research is a job really. Every day is different. Yeah. So you discover things, you always learn, and this is refreshing to learn new things every day. Sometimes you are even the first to know something in the whole world. You will, you're the first that observed uh, um, something that um, came out of an experiment, and it, it is an exciting experience. It's not always rewarding. Sometimes it's tough, sometimes it's disappointing. Um, there are sad moments, uh, sometimes you might even feel depressed because you didn't, for example, publish your paper or you didn't get your grant. Uh, but uh, overall, I think the excitement is continuous. And the fact that this is not like going and uh, doing the same thing uh, over and over every day uh, is really refreshing and it's keeping you up at night. And uh, I, I, would, I would never consider it as a job, really. So more like a hobby. So whenever, whenever even you swim, you are working. Well, well, the good thing about science is that you always think about the experiments. You always think about what to do next. So it never leaves you. Even you know during your uh, time in bed, you might be thinking about uh, some some experiment that you need to do next day. So perfect. it's something that you take with you wherever you go. Yeah, I agree with that. So, just to, 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 to finalize, that uh, this is not uh, um, scientific, but in three words, what is what you wish at this stage of your life, what you wish that we go over this and then we thank you very much. So, from Danny, in three words, what is your wish at this stage of your life where you've achieved so much? What is something, it is your wish, three, four words, not more. Instead of talking about myself. Oh, yeah, you, you, you. It's important. Yourself. I would like to comment on something that uh, Sir uh, Richard said before that we depend, everything depends on luck. And I, I don't know whether people realize, but those who listen to me, ask yourself, what was your chance to be born? I'll give you the answer now. Zero. The chance of somebody to be born is practically zero. Just look at the process. How many 100 million sperms injected into your mother by your father, and you won that race. Your sperm won that race. What are the chances? And so, and they did it not once. Number two. So the chance to be born is, is a very, very minimal, but your father had to be born and your mother had to be born. So you have to multiply the chances and you have to go back to the first uh, amoeba in the swamp. So the chance to be born is zero. So the greatest gift that somebody has is the gift of life. There is nothing comparable to it, nothing at all comparable to it. And what does it mean? 
it means live wisely. Live wisely. That's two words, by the way. More concentrated. <laughs> well, this is a definition of Danny's meaning of life, by the way. He mentioned this in 2014 in Cancun, Mexico. The question was, what's your meaning of life? And this, this was the highlight of the event. Okay, two, three, two, three words. What do you wish? Well, I had uh, uh, 15 years of really exciting research where just every, every, every day is more exciting than the other. So uh, surely I wish for, for another spam like this, but maybe that uh, my art would be on a uh, uh, compatible with with my with my scientific achievements. So more scientific achievements? No, more art on the and which, which would more be more art. Yes, which would work as good as artist good as, of science. Good. Okay, Professor Robert. Two three words. I wish. I wish everybody has the luck that I had, <laughs> and if you fail, do not worry. Do a post mortem find out why you failed and learn from it. This is the most valuable thing that kids can really get. And I think when teachers tell them that they're a failure and chastise them for it, that is terrible. Failure is good. Almost everybody who succeeds failed first. So what's your wish? Well, the, the fail and win. And learn. Fail and win. Good, oh, okay. Three words. Then the lawyer. I, I, I um, guess this is related to judges. Yeah, no, it doesn't relate to judges, but it's funny because I was listening to the comments about luck, and uh, I, it reminded me of another statement that an old timer made, which I saw somewhere recently on a sign, and that is, "The harder I work, the better my luck is." So I think that's uh, that's also something that people have oh, to yeah. remember. But uh, so a client gave me several years ago who had went through a very difficult um, situation. So gave me a sign that's in my office right now, and it's the it's the L's right now just like uh just like we were talking about with luck but it says live love laugh and said that i helped them with my sense of humor through a very difficult time so it's on my wall that says live love laugh and i would probably add one more l learn live love and laugh live love laugh and i'll add three words, learn. Three words. those oh, are the you asked for three words so three words yeah three words three words <laughs> i'm concentrating what they said in three words, uh, um, I uh, I wish um, support, help people. Support, help, health, people, people. Yeah, that's it. Support. Oh, support and help people. Yes. Okay, yes, that's yes. a that's a medical doctor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Professor Tavanerakis. So, wish in three words. <laughs> well, I think that it, it is very important for everyone to be productive, for human beings to be productive. So I would wish for all of us to continue being productive until our very long age, very old age. And for me, to enjoy tonight the show that is coming. That's my wish. Thank you very much.